Section 5 of Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Krantz. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 1, by John G. Nicolay and John Hay. Section 5. Lincoln in the Black Hawk War. Side note, 1832. A new period in the life of Lincoln begins with the summer of 1832. He then obtained his first public recognition and entered upon the course of life which was to lead him to a position of prominence and great usefulness. The business of Offutt had gone to pieces, and his clerk was out of employment, when Governor Reynolds issued his call for volunteers to move the tribe of Black Hawk across the Mississippi. For several years the raids of the old Sac chieftain upon that portion of his patrimony, which he had ceded to the United States, had kept the settlers in the neighborhood of Rock Island in terror, and menaced the peace of the frontier. In the spring of 1831 he came over to the east side of the river with a considerable band of warriors, having been encouraged by secret promises of cooperation from several other tribes. These failed him, however, when the time of trial arrived, and an improvised force of state volunteers, assisted by General E. P. Gaines and his detachment, had little difficulty in compelling the Indians to recross the Mississippi, and to enter into a solemn treaty on the 30th of June, by which the former treaties were ratified, and Black Hawk and his leading warriors bound themselves never again to set foot on the east side of the river, without express permission from the President or the Governor of Illinois. Side note. Reynolds, Life and Times, page 325. Side note. History of Illinois, page 110. But Black Hawk was too old a savage to learn respect for treaties or resignation under fancied wrongs. He was all a term of life, chief of his nation for more than forty years. He had scalped his first enemy when scarcely more than a child, having painted on his blanket the blood-red hand which marked his nobility at fifteen years of age. Peace under any circumstances would doubtless have been irksome to him but a peace which forbade him free access to his own hunting-grounds and to the graves of his fathers was more than he could now school himself to endure he had come to believe that he had been foully wronged by the treaty which was his own act he had even convinced himself that land cannot be sold a proposition in political economy which our modern socialists would be puzzled to accept or confute besides this the tenderest feelings of his heart were outraged by this exclusion from his former domain he had never passed a year since the death of his daughter without making a pilgrimage to her grave at okwaka and spending hours in mystic ceremonies and contemplation he was himself prophet as well as warrior and had doubtless his share of mania which is the strength of prophets the promptings of his own broken heart readily seemed to him the whisperings of attendant spirits, and day by day these unseen incitements increased around him, until they could not be resisted even if death stood in the way. He made his combinations during the winter, and had it not been for the loyal attitude of Keokuk, he could have brought the entire nation of the sacks and foxes to the war-path. As it was, the flower of the young men came with him, when, with the opening spring, he crossed the river once more. He came this time, he said, to plant corn, but as a preliminary to this peaceful occupation of the land he marched up the Rock River, expecting to be joined by the Winnebagoes and Potawatomies. But the time was past for honorable alliances among the Indians. His oath-bound confederates gave him little assistance, and soon cast in their lot with the stronger party. This movement excited general alarm in the state. General Henry Atkinson, commanding the United States troops, sent a formal summons to Black Hawk to return. But the old chief was already well on his way to the lodge of his friend, the prophet Wabakishik, at Prophetstown, and treated the summons with contemptuous defiance. 
the governor immediately called for volunteers and was himself astonished at the alacrity with which the call was answered among those who enlisted at the first tap of the drum was abraham lincoln and equally to his surprise and delight he was elected captain of his company the volunteer organizations of those days were conducted on purely democratic principles the company assembled on the green an election was suggested and three-fourths of the men walked over to where lincoln was standing most of the small remainder joined themselves to one kirk patrick a man of some substance and standing from spring creek we have the word of mr lincoln for it that no subsequent success ever gave him such unmixed pleasure as this earliest distinction it was a sincere unsought tribute of his equals to those physical and moral qualities which made him the best man of his hundred and as such was accepted and prized side note reynolds life and times page 363 at the beardstown rendezvous captain lincoln's company was attached to colonel samuel thompson's regiment the fourth illinois which was organized at richland sangamon county on the twenty first of april and moved on the twenty seventh with the rest of the command under general samuel whitesides for yellow banks where the boats with provisions had been ordered to meet them it was arduous marching there were no roads and no bridges and the day's task included a great deal of labor the third day out they came to the henderson river a stream some fifty yards wide swift and swollen with the spring thaws with high and steep banks to most armies this would have seemed a serious obstacle, but these backwoodsmen swarmed to the work like beavers, and in less than three hours the river was crossed with the loss of only one or two horses and wagons. When they came to Yellow Banks on the Mississippi, the provision boats had not arrived, and for three days they waited there literally without food. Very uncomfortable days for Governor Reynolds, who accompanied the expedition, and was forced to hear the outspoken comments of two thousand hungry men on his supposed inefficiency but the sixth of may the william wallace arrived and this sight says the governor with characteristic sincerity was i presume the most interesting i ever beheld from there they marched to the mouth of rock river and thence general whitesides proceeded with his volunteers up the river some ninety miles to dixon where they halted to await the arrival of General Atkinson with the regular troops and provisions. There they found two battalions of fresh horsemen under Majors Stillman and Bailey, who had as yet seen no service, and were eager for the fray. Whiteside's men were tired with their forced march, and besides, in their ardor to get forward, they had thrown away a good part of their provisions and left their baggage behind. It pleased the governor, therefore, to listen to the prayers of Stillman's braves, and he gave them orders to proceed to the head of Old Man's Creek, where it was supposed there were some hostile Indians, and coerce them into submission. I thought, says the governor in his memoirs, they might discover the enemy. The supposition was certainly well founded. They rode merrily away, came to Old Man's Creek, thereafter to be called Stillman's Run, and encamped for the night. By the failing light a small party of Indians was discovered on the summit of a hill a mile away, and a few courageous gentlemen hurriedly saddled their horses, and without orders rode after them. The Indians retreated, but were soon overtaken, and two or three of them killed. The volunteers were now strung along a half mile of hill and valley, with no more order or care than if they had been chasing rabbits. Black Hawk, who had been at supper when the running fight began, hastily gathered a handful of warriors and attacked the scattered whites. The onset of the savages acted like an icy bath on the red-hot valor of the volunteers. They turned and ran for their lives, stampeding the camp as they fled. There was very little resistance, so little that Black Hawk, fearing a ruse, tried to recall his warriors from the pursuit, but in the darkness and confusion could not enforce his orders. The Indians killed all they caught up with, but the volunteers had the fleeter horses, and only eleven were overtaken. The rest reached Dixon by twos and threes, rested all night, and took courage. General Whitesides marched out to the scene of the disaster the next morning, but the Indians were gone. 
they had broken up into small parties and for several days they reaped the bloody fruit of their victory in the massacre of peaceful settlements in the adjacent districts the time of enlistment of the volunteers had now come to an end and the men seeing no prospect of glory or profit and weary of the work and the hunger which were the only certain incidents of the campaign refused in great part to continue in service but it is hardly necessary to say that captain lincoln was not one of these homesick soldiers not even the trammels of rank which are usually so strong among the trailers of the sabre could restrain him from what he considered his simple duty as soon as he was mustered out of his captaincy he re-enlisted on the same day may twenty seven as a private soldier several other officers did the same among them general whitesides and major john t stewart lincoln became a member of captain elijah isle's company of mounted volunteers sometimes called the independent spy battalion an organization unique of its kind if we may judge from the account given by one of its troopers it was not says mr george m harrison under the control of any regiment or brigade but received orders directly from the commander-in-chief and always when with the army camped within the lines and had many other privileges such as having no camp duties to perform and drawing rations as much and as often as we pleased which would seem to liken this battalion as nearly as possible to the fabled regiment of brigadiers with this elite corps lincoln served through his second enlistment though it was not his fortune to take part in either of the two engagements in which general james d henry at the wisconsin bluffs and the bad axe broke and destroyed forever the power of black hawk and the british band of sacks and foxes after lincoln was relieved of the weight of dignity involved in his captaincy the war became a sort of holiday and the tall private from new salem enjoyed it as much as any one he entered with great zest into the athletic sports with which soldiers love to beguile the tedium of camp he was admitted to be the strongest man in the army and with one exception the best wrestler indeed his friends never admitted the exception and severely blamed lincoln for confessing himself defeated on the occasion when he met the redoubtable thompson and the two fell together on the turf his popularity increased from the beginning to the end of the campaign and those of his comrades who still survive always speak with hearty and affectionate praise of his character and conduct in those rough yet pleasantly remembered days side note manuscript letters from thomas greg and others the spy battalion formed no part of general henry's forces when by a disobedience of orders as prudent as it was audacious he started with his slender force on the fresh trail which he was sure would lead him to black hawk's camp he found and struck the enemy at bay on the bluffs of the wisconsin river on the twenty first of july and inflicted upon them a signal defeat the broken remnant of black hawk's power then fled for the mississippi river the whole army following in close pursuit general atkinson in front and general henry bringing up the rear fortune favored the latter once more for while black hawk with a handful of men was engaging and drawing away the force under atkinson general henry struck the main trail and brought on the battle of the bad axe if that could be called a battle which was an easy slaughter of the weary and discouraged savages fighting without heart or hope an army in front and the great river behind black hawk escaped the fate of his followers to be captured a few days later through the treachery of his allies he was carried in triumph to washington and presented to president jackson to whom he made this stern and defiant speech showing how little age or disaster could do to tame his indomitable spirit i am a man and you are another i did not expect to conquer the white people i took up the hatchet to avenge injuries which could no longer be borne footnote it is a noteworthy coincidence that president lincoln's proclamation at the opening of the war calls for troops to redress wrongs already long enough endured End footnote. had i borne them longer my people would have said black hawk is a squaw he is too old to be a chief he is no sack 
This caused me to raise the war whoop. I say no more of it. All is known to you. He returned to Iowa and died on the 3rd of October, 1838, at his camp on the River Des Moines. He was buried in gala dress, with cocked hat and sword, and the medals presented him by two governments. He was not allowed to rest even in his grave. His bones were exhumed by some greedy wretch, and sold from hand to hand, till they came at last to the Burlington Museum, where they were destroyed by fire. It was on the 16th of June, a month before the slaughter of the bad axe, that the battalion to which Lincoln belonged was at last mustered out at Whitewater, Wisconsin. His final release from the service was signed by a young lieutenant of artillery, Robert Anderson, who, twenty-nine years later, in one of the most awful crises in our annals, was to sustain to Lincoln relations of prodigious importance on a scene illuminated by the flash of the opening guns of the Civil War. Footnote a story to the effect that Lincoln was mustered into service by Jefferson Davis has for a long time been current, but the strictest search in the records fails to confirm it. We are indebted to General R. C. Drum, Adjutant General of the Army, for an interesting letter giving all the known facts in relation to this story. General Drum says, The company of the 4th Regiment Illinois Mounted Volunteers, commanded by Mr. Lincoln, was, with others, called out by General Reynolds, and was organized at Richland, Sangamon County, Illinois, April 21, 1832. The muster in roll is not on file, but the records show that the company was mustered out at the mouth of Fox River, May 27, 1832, by Nathaniel Buckmaster, brigade major to General Samuel Whiteside's Illinois Volunteers. On the muster roll of Captain Elijah Isles' company, Illinois Mounted Volunteers, A. Lincoln, Sangamon County, appears as a private from May 27, 1832, to June 16, 1832, when the company was mustered out of service by Lieutenant Robert Anderson, 3rd United States Artillery, and Colonel, Assistant Inspector General, Illinois Volunteers. Brigadier General Henry Atkinson, in his report of May 30, 1832, stated that the Illinois volunteers were called out by the governor of that state, but in haste and for no definite period of service. On their arrival at Ottawa, they became clamorous for their discharge, which the governor granted, retaining, of those who were discharged and volunteered for a further period of twenty days, a sufficient number of men to form six companies, which General Atkinson found at Ottawa on his arrival there from Rock River. General Atkinson further reports that these companies and some 300 regular troops remaining in position at Rock River were all the force left him to keep the enemy in check until the assemblage of the 3,000 additional Illinois militia called out by the governor upon his, General A's, requisition to rendezvous at Ottawa, June 12th through 15th, 1832, there can be no doubt that Captain Isles' company, mentioned above, was one of the six which served until June 16, 1832, while the fact is fully established that the company of which Mr. Lincoln was a member was mustered out by Lieutenant Robert Anderson, who, in April 1861, was in command of Fort Sumter. There is no evidence to show that it was mustered in by Lieutenant Jefferson Davis. Mr. Davis's company, B, 1st United States Infantry, was stationed at Fort Crawford, Wisconsin, during the months of January and February, 1832, and he is born on the rolls as absent on detached service at the Dubuque Mines, by order of Colonel Morgan. From March 26 to August 18, 1832, the muster rolls of his company report him as absent on furlough. End footnote. The men started home the next day in high spirits, schoolboys, for their holidays. Lincoln had need, like Horatio, of his good spirits, for they were his only outfit for the long journey to New Salem. He and his messmate, Harrison, footnote, George M. Harrison, who gives an account of his personal experiences in Le Mans, page 116, end footnote, having had their horses stolen the day before by some patriot over-anxious to reach home. But as Harrison says, I laughed at our fate, and he joked at it, and we all started off merrily. 
the generous men of our company walked and rode by turns with us and we fared about equal with the rest but for this generosity our legs would have had to do the better work for in that day this dreary route furnished no horses to buy or to steal and whether on horse or afoot we always had company for many of the horses backs were too sore for riding it is not hard to imagine with what quips and quirks of native fancy lincoln and his friends beguiled the way through forest and prairie with youth good health and a clear conscience and even then the dawn of a young and undefiled ambition in his heart nothing was wanting to give zest and spice to this long sociable walk of a hundred leagues one joke is preserved and this one is at the expense of lincoln one chilly morning he complained of being cold no wonder said some facetious cavalier there is so much of you on the ground footnote dr holland gives this homely joke life of lincoln page seventy one but transfers it to a time four years later when lincoln had permanently assumed shoes and had a horse of his own End footnote. we hope lincoln's contributions to the fun were better than this but of course the prosperity of these jests lay rather in the liberal ears that heard them than in the good-natured tongues that uttered them lincoln and harrison could not have been altogether penniless for at peoria they bought a canoe and paddled down to pekin here the ingenious lincoln employed his hereditary talent for carpentry by making an oar for the frail vessel while harrison was providing the commissary stores the latter goes on to say the river being very low was without current so that we had to pull hard to make half the speed of legs on land in fact we let her float all night and on the next morning always found the objects still visible that were beside us the previous evening the water was remarkably clear for this river of plants and the fish appeared to be sporting with us as we moved over or neared them on the next day after we left pekin we overhauled a raft of saw logs with two men afloat on it to urge it on with poles and to guide it in the channel we immediately pulled up to them and went on the raft where we were made welcome by various demonstrations especially by an invitation to a feast on fish cornbread eggs butter and coffee just prepared for our benefit of these good things we ate almost immoderately for it was the only warm meal we had made for several days while preparing it and after dinner lincoln entertained them and they entertained us for a couple of hours very amusingly kindly human companionship was a luxury in that green wilderness and was readily appreciated and paid for the returning warriors dropped down the river to the village of havana from pekin to havana in a canoe the country is full of these geographical nightmares the necessary result of freedom of nomenclature bestowed by circumstances upon minds equally destitute of taste or education there they sold their boat no difficult task for a canoe was a staple article in any river town and again set out the old way over the sand ridges for petersburg as we drew near home the impulse became stronger and urged us on amazingly the long strides of lincoln often slipping back in the loose sand six inches every step were just right for me and he was greatly diverted when he noticed me behind him stepping along in his tracks to keep from slipping thus the two comrades came back from their soldierings to their humble homes from which lincoln was soon to start on the way marked out for him by providence with strides which no comrade with whatever good will might hope to follow he never took his campaigning seriously the politician's habit of glorifying the petty incidents of a candidate's life always seemed absurd to him and in his speech made in eighteen forty eight ridiculing the effort on the part of general cass's friends to draw some political advantage from that gentleman's respectable but obscure services on the frontier in the war with great britain he stopped any future eulogist from painting his own military achievements in two lively colors did you know mr speaker he said i am a military hero in the days of the black hawk war i fought bled and came away i was not at stillman's defeat but i was about as near it as general cass was to hull's surrender and like him i saw the place very soon afterwards it is quite certain i did not break my sword for i had none to break but i bent my musket pretty badly on one occasion 
if general cass went in advance of me picking hortleberries i guess i surpassed him in charges on the wild onions if he saw any live fighting indians it was more than i did but i had a good many bloody struggles with the mosquitoes and although i never fainted from loss of blood i can truly say i was often very hungry if ever i should conclude to doff whatever our democratic friends may suppose there is of black cockade federalism about me and thereupon they shall take me up as their candidate for the presidency i protest that they shall not make fun of me as they have of general cass by attempting to write me into a military hero End of section 5. Recording by Pamela Krantz.